Hi everybody, welcome to InsideHockey.tv alongside Kevin Greenstein. I'm your host, Mackenzie Lavoie. Well, the trade deadline is fast approaching and right now it looks like there are three teams in the Northeast Division Conference that looks like they're going to approach it substantially different than one another. What are your thoughts on the trade deadline and how, for one, the Boston Bruins, who are our buyer pick for today, going to approach March 4th? Well, you're right. I mean, I think when you look at the trade deadline, there are three different approaches. One is as a buyer, a team that is going to be trying to acquire talent to make a run at the cup. Mm -hmm. There's the sellers, obviously, teams that are out of the running, trying to accumulate prospects and draft picks to improve their fortunes for the future. And there are those teams that are betwixt and between. Maybe they're tight on the cap and they don't have a lot of flexibility, but they will need to move a player to make some room for whatever additions are necessary to fortify themselves for that run. So looking first at a buyer, you mentioned the Boston Bruins. I think they absolutely are in a position where they should be buying. They have a lot of opportunity available to them. They've got about $3 million in cap space, and that translates at the deadline to approximately $14 million worth of annual salaries that they can mm -hmm. add to fortify themselves for that cup run. In addition, they've got Manny Fernandez on the books. Manny is being paid close to $5 million a year, so you can add him into the mix as well as an asset that they can trade, knowing that they've got Tim Thomas and Goal and Tuka Rask as a very, very su suitable substitute, mm -hmm. you know, fill-in. To bring up, yeah. So if you look at all of those additions that they could possibly make, the Bruins could really make a lot of moves in advance of the deadline to give themselves a chance to run at the cup. Now we go to another original six team, the Montreal Canadiens, who are our middle team. They're not really sure. They need to buy. They need to sell. Now they have a habit of not signing unrestricted free agents. They got rid of straight. They got let a rider last year. Riders playing unbelievably with the Boston Bruins. Now Komisarek is the big guy that's up at the end of the year. How are they going to approach this and still have enough cap space to give him what he wants coming into the season next year? Well, you know what? You look at the Montreal Canadiens, and the one player that they really made an, an, an effort to re-sign and keep was Andre Markov. Mm -hmm. They let some guys go, but Andre Markov, they decided, was the cornerstone of their defense at the time, and they made sure he stayed. Looking ahead now, I think Mike Komisarek is that guy. Mm -hmm. He's going to get that attention that is necessary. You look at the Montreal Canadiens, and they are a team that is, I thought, going into this season, a legitimate cup contender. Mm -hmm. They've got a top young goaltender in Carey Price. They've got some good talent up front. Guys like Kovalev and Tangu, Tangang Koivu. So I really do think the Montreal Canadiens are well positioned to make a run at the cup. It'll be interesting to see what they are able to do in terms of clearing cap space. I mean, 800000 in cap space doesn't sound like a lot, but you have to figure as you're approaching the deadline that 800 expands and what it can buy. And they might be you know, able to add a $3 million player by the time the deadline approaches. Now so. it We've, we've heard the rumors so far about Vinny Le Cavalier being traded to Montreal from Tampa Bay. How do you feel that's going to progress? Will, do you think that's a possibility coming in to what we're looking at? Well, from a hockey standpoint, I think Vincent Le Cavalier would be a very nice addition for the Montreal Canadiens. As I mentioned, the cap situation is going to make such a move challenging because Le Cavalier is on the books for quite mm -hmm. a considerable sum of money every year. But the real question is, if the Montreal Canadiens were to acquire Vincent Le Cavalier, how would he handle the situation in Montreal? I mean, he's a guy, he's played his whole career in Tampa Bay in relative anonymity. It's not the same in Montreal, right, is under it? under the radar. No, no coming, especially being from Montreal, you, you grow up with the ideal of the Montreal Canadiens and the French-born players, the French-speaking players, the guys that are from Montreal who come back in the summers, who are in U.S. markets, are completely revered during the summer because they're home. So if you put Vinny Le Cavalier in Montreal year-round with the media coverage, with he's going to be expected to be the savior of the Montreal Canadiens for yeah. the year, and I don't necessarily think that's fair to put that much pressure on him coming into a new team that has that chemistry already. Now he's obviously a great leader. You see him around all the time. He does so much for the community. He does so much for the charities. But with the media exposure that he just got from the All-Star game, it was frightening because he was not left alone. So you have to think of how is that going to affect his game on the ice, off the ice with his teammates. There's going to be a lot of attention given to him and no one else. So you're going to put him at a team that already has its established chemistry so far and it's just going to be this mass chaos when he comes to camp because he is a French-speaking player and he will be revered as the fan favorite and the team favorite and you have to wonder how that's going to affect the season. Yeah, well you look at this Tampa Bay Lightning team and it's sort of interesting, you know, they've built their s themselves after the lockout mm -hmm. around Le Cavalier and also Marty St. Louis and Brad Richards. Mm -hmm. 
And we saw how poorly that experiment yeah. went, building around three forwards. Three forwards, three lockdown forwards who all make considerable amounts of money. Well, now let's look at our third team in the Northeast Division, the Ottawa Senators. Mm -hmm. And I think that we can say that the Ottawa Senators are probably going to be sellers at the deadline. Of course, yeah. And they too, like the Tampa Bay Lightning, are a team built around a trio of very expensive forwards. Mm -hmm. Danny Heatley, Daniel Alfredson, and Jason Spezza. To me, I think that it's time for that trio to be broken up because... I don't see how the Senators are going to fix their mess if they don't. Well, if, if you base your team on, on three All-Stars, you, you have to wonder what happens if something happens to one of them, if one of them goes out with an injury, if the chemistry gets messed up, and then you don't have enough space to bring in other guys to mold around the All-Stars. Because, like, let's just look at a team like Pittsburgh. You have Rob Scuderi, who's very off the radar. He's not an All-Star, but you notice everything that he does because he's an unbelievable player. Yep. So you put him behind Crosby and you put him behind those guys and it's going to work. But when you just have three major players and everyone is just kind of expected to mold around them, it tends to backfire. And it's also a positional issue as well. When you look at the Pittsburgh Penguins, this season they're dealing with tremendous injuries on their back line. Mm -hmm. Sergei Gonchar out, Ryan, right? Whitney. Ryan Whitney out. And they've got Marc-Andre Fleury to help stem the tide mm -hmm. a little bit in goal. But the adage is defense wins championships. Yeah. And the, the common link between the Senators and the Lightning is that they've built themselves around three high-priced forwards. Yep. And I think that that's really the problem there. And until they can reconstruct their team in a way that they're built around a defensive core as well as maybe one or two all-star forwards, they're not going to have a fighting chance in that tough Northeast division. Yeah, it's hard to get a team that, that's going to work together. And when, when you still want the big names for you know revenue and whatnot, but you still have to mold the team around an entire team, not just three guys. Well, everybody, thank you very much for joining us on this edition of Inside Hockey TV. We hope to see you back here next time.